Well, we're turning in God's Word this morning to Psalm 24. And in our autumn winter season, from September through to December, we focus on the morning services on the Psalms of Scripture, uh, the Songbook of Israel. And our hearts have been blessed as we've looked through these Psalms and how each one of them has pointed us to Christ. And we trust that this, this will be a blessing to your heart. It'll be a challenge to your heart. It certainly has been to mine as I've studied it this week. And we want to read this together and then commit our time to the Lord. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this psalm. We rejoice, Lord, already. The the challenge to our hearts, Lord, as we read some of those verses. And we thank thee that this is the living word of the living God. Uh, You have ordained that we would read and preach upon it today, that this congregation would be here, that, Lord, it would change our lives. And we pray that we will uh, know that the word of God is free course today because the spirit of God is here applying the word effectually to hearts. And Lord, take away distractions today. Anything, Lord, maybe in our mind that uh, would cause us to think about other things that are really not appropriate. We pray, Lord, our focus will be on the word of God. And Lord, that there'll be a word in season for each one, whether saved or unsaved. Lord, speak to us. This is the way. Walk ye in it. And I pray, Lord, you'll empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit and give me help to be faithful to thy word, to my savior, to this congregation. And may we truly know more of thy truth. And may we be found uh, in deeper faith with thee and a deeper love with thee. Lord, even at the end of this time, because we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen and amen. Now, Psalm 22, 23 and 24 really could be taken together as a group. Psalm 22 is often called the Psalm of the cross. And we can understand that because in verse number 16, it talks about at the end of it, they pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. Verse number one, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we can see that that is pointing us forward to what was going to happen there on the cross of Calvary. And as we went down that, how blessed we were to remember that while The suffering of Christ was in the first part of that psalm. We saw the victory of Christ in the last part of the psalm and that the Lord had us on his mind as he was dying upon the cross. Those were very precious thoughts. Then last winter, we uh, studied Psalm 23 and we took that over six or seven services. And that not only was the the psalm of the, the cross, this is the psalm of the crook or the psalm of the shepherd. And here we see the Lord Jesus Christ as the great shepherd who not only has given his life for the sheep, but gives to his sheep all of those blessings that are contained in this psalm. So the psalm of the cross, psalm of the crook, and then psalm 24, the psalm of the crown, because it's talking about the Lord, our king, and about his rule and his reign and his holiness and his majesty. And therefore we see the Lord uh, high and lifted up, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And next week, in the will of the Lord, should we be living and spared? We're going to answer that question. Who is this King of glory? And we look forward to preaching on that. But it's the first part of Psalm 24. 
we want to think about. We could divide this into three parts, really, this psalm, to give you an outline. Verses 1 and 2 could be entitled, Acknowledging the King. Acknowledging the King. Verses 3 to 6 could be entitled, Approaching the King. And then verses 7 through 10 could be entitled, Accepting the King. So three different aspects of the king and his relationship to us. And we're looking at it from three different angles in this one psalm, but he is the unchanging one. So first of all, let us look acknowledging the king. Verses one and two, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And here we are acknowledging the king, who he is, what he has done. We notice that there are two things that belong unto the Lord, or it's described in two ways, the earth and its fullness, the world and its people. And that's how the king is described in his reign and in his authority. He rules and reigns over the earth and its, its fullness and the world and its people. Now, not only... C.H. Burton said, not only does the actual earth that God has created belong to him, but the fullness thereof. And the fullness of the earth could be translated as its harvests, its wealth, its life, or its worship. And that's the interpretation of that word, the fullness thereof. So we could say the earth and the harvests of the earth, they belong to the Lord. The earth and the wealth of the earth, it belongs to the Lord. In Genesis chapter 1, 29, the Lord said these words, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Whenever God created this world, he created those things that were able to grow and reproduce And therefore, there was always going to be a harvest. He actually has decreed that as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. So there is a harvest that God has prepared, even thinking of us in this day and generation, as God created the world, as God brought to pass the plants and the, uh, the herbs that can recreate and reproduce, the Lord had us in mind. He was preparing also for us, not just from Adam and Eve, but for all who would live upon this earth. And therefore, as you sit down to your plate of dinner this afternoon or this evening, the meal that is before you has been provided by the Lord. Now, yes, we know there were farmers involved in the process. There were factories involved, maybe in canning stuff or putting stuff together. There were shops involved, all of those things. But ultimately, it has come from the Lord. He has given the sun and the rain for the food to grow, the strength of the body for people to harvest it, further provision, which is necessary to provide that food. And we ought to thank God for his daily provision. I wonder this morning, as you ate your toast, drank your tea, took your cereal, did you say, thank you, Lord, for what I'm eating this morning? Thank you for the provision upon this table that you have given so graciously to me. Not only can the word fullness mean the harvests, but it also can mean wealth. And you know, there's many people today look at their bank account and they fill themselves with pride at what they have accomplished. But the reality is that bank account is a result of the body, the mind, and the physical strength that God has given to be able to engage in work that brings financial reward. Even the people who work with materials and provide things and have businesses, God has given the raw materials that we work with. And he has provided the very base things that we use and the products to make the products that we sell. The Royal Exchange is a building in London, and it was first built in the late 1500s. It was built for the dealings of traders and merchants that were coming into the city and also for the buying and selling of stocks. Now, the building actually has been destroyed twice in its history by fire. So the building that stands in London today called the Royal Exchange is actually the third uh, type of the third building that has stood in that place. It was built in the 1800s. It was opened by Queen Victoria in 1844. And over the entrance of the Royal Exchange in London, if you take time to stop and look up, you will find that there is a large gable of stone and a craftsman has sculpted 17 different uh, people who have seven 
who are depicted as fulfilling 17 different occupations. There's a farmer, there's a banker, there's a baker, all of the different occupations that were in the world at that time. 17 figures. In the middle of it, there's a mythical figure called Commerce. But below her, Prince Albert chose a scripture text to put on the front of that building. And it's Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the thought behind that was, that as every person, every trader, every merchant, every stock trader went into that building, they were walking under the word of God, reminding them that everything they're dealing with on the inside actually has come from the Lord. Isn't it good for us to have that thought? When was the last time you walked into your home and said, Lord, thank you for this home that I have? Oh, it may not be the biggest, it may not be the grandest, it may not be everything that you want it to be, but God has given it to you. When did you last say thank you? Do you acknowledge God's provision as you eat your meals, his goodness as you begin or end a day of work, duties and activities that only can be done because he's blessed you with health, strength, soundness of body and mind? Oh, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. And then we read that the world is the Lord's and all they that dwell therein. Now, David, who obviously is a psalmist here, David was a successful king. He was a great king. He was a courageous king, victorious in battle. And the Lord did use him to bring great strength and victory to Israel. And whenever Solomon took over, Solomon's reign was one of peace. And that is largely because of the victory that David wrought in the wars during his lifetime. Solomon enjoyed a time of great peace in which he could uh, build the temple in safety. But as great and powerful as King David was, he had to acknowledge at this time that the world in which he reigned and the people over whom he ruled belonged to the Lord. They were not his. Yes, in that sense, they were his subjects. He had to protect them and look out for them. But ultimately, they belonged to the Lord. You know, as I think about that, we think about the elders in the congregation. God has given us a people to love, to rule over, to teach. But ultimately, they belong to the Lord. And we have to give an account of how we have served them. Parents, uh, you have children that belong to you and you're grateful for them. But ultimately, they belong to the Lord. God has given them to you, and you'll give an account of how you have raised those children. Matthew Henry said, we ourselves are not our own. Our bodies, our souls are not. All souls are mine, saith God, for he is the former of the bodies and the father of our spirits. And why can God make such a claim? Why can the Lord say, this earth and everything in it is mine? This world and all the people in it, they are mine. Why can the Lord say that? Well, because of verse 2. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And the Lord can say this because he has created this world. And therefore, he has the right and the authority to do exactly with it what he wills. There's a verse in scripture, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it just at hand. But it talks about the clay. The clay can't say to the potter, do this or do that. It's the potter that is power over the clay. And therefore, the Lord is our creator. He has created this world. Do you see the importance of Genesis chapter 1? Do you see the importance of having a solid foundation of who God is? You know, some people say, well, I, I believe in God and I'm trusting in the Lord to save me, but I don't really believe that Genesis chapter 1 is literal. You know, I think we can take that and leave it as long as you're trusting. But in whom are you trusting? Because the God of Scripture is the God that said, let there be light and there was light. The God of Scripture is the God who created this world and everything within it. And therefore, this morning, if you are going to trust the God of Scripture, if you're going to put your faith in his finished work and his provision, you have to be trusting in the one who is revealed in Scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And therefore, we come this morning, and we acknowledge that God is the creator of all things. And we're completely against anything that would try to take the Lord out of His position of creator, whether it is a theory 
whether it is an ideology, whether it is a, a movement or even a religion, we believe God is the creator of heaven and earth. And because of that, we are answerable to him. Because of that, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Now, people can gather themselves into groups, can't they, that they identify with and they feel comfortable with. Their nationality, their religion, their interests in particular activity. But, you know, in doing that, they exclude themselves from all their groups. So if I say this morning, well, I'm a free Presbyterian, I've automatically excluded myself from belonging to other groups or other churches or other religious bodies. But there's one group you cannot exclude yourself from. The atheist can't exclude himself from this group. The agnostic and even those who fight against God cannot change the fact of time and eternity that all who dwell upon this earth owe their existence to God. They were created by him. They have given a lot of time upon this earth in its wisdom, and one day they'll stand before him to hear his judgment. They'll either be welcomed into heaven as his child or reject it as his enemy. Maybe you're here this morning not saved. And you've often thought, what right does a preacher have to say to me, you need to be saved? What right do people have to pray for my soul? What right does God have to say that I must be saved if I want to be in heaven? Well, this is the right that he has. He's your creator, your sustainer. And our life on this earth will come to an end. It's going to happen one of two ways. There's one of two ways you will meet God. Either the Lord will return in our lifetime. 2 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. What a day that will be. Or, if it's not the Lord's will for us to be on the earth when he comes, we will die. And Hebrews chapter 9, 27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, a judgment. Either way, I will stand before God. You will stand before God. And the question is, are you ready? Can you say this morning, you have peace in your heart because you know that your soul is right before a holy God. If the Lord should call your soul today, if you should die today, if the clouds should part and time shall be no more today, have you a peace about that? Because you're resting in the Lord. Secondly, let us consider verses 3 down to verse 6. And we've thought about acknowledging the king. Secondly, approaching the king. And the very fact that we will meet him someday, the very fact we will stand before him, brings us to the questions of verse number three. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Now, these questions are effectively the same question being repeated for emphasis. You can see that it's done actually at the end of the chapter as well. Uh, Verse number eight, who is this king of glory? Verse number 10, who is this king of glory? In the Hebrew, when they want to really write something in bold type, they repeat it, they say it twice. So therefore, this is for our consideration. It's so important. Who shall ascend in the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? They're asking, who's the right to stand before God? Who really has a right to stand in the presence of God? I wonder, have you ever acknowledged that he is your creator and sustainer? Have you ever acknowledged he is your judge? Have you ever acknowledged he's provided his son to be your savior? And only through faith in him, you can stand before God and be accepted as his child in the place that God has prepared for his people in heaven. I want to say something this morning that might shock you, but it's God's truth. All roads lead to hell apart from the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. All roads lead to hell. Some people say, preacher, that's too narrow. That's too offensive. 
That is too hard for me to accept, but I remind you today it's a biblical truth. This is not my opinion. This is God's revelation from heaven. And among the nations he has ordained that this word should be preached, that people shall be given opportunity to turn from their sin, to trust in him, to be saved, to be ready to die, to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. How can I be sure that Jesus is the only way? Because that's the message of Scripture. In Isaiah 45, 22, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is none else. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man, woman, boy or girl, cometh unto the Father, but by me. And if we look down at verses 4, or verse 4 particularly, we will see that these verses can be applied as the necessary preparation to meet God at the end of your life. What is required? Well, you have to have clean hands, a pure heart, have not lifted your soul up onto vanity, and you have not sworn deceitfully. I have put them into this way. Clean hands, pure heart, a humble soul, and honest speech. What is that speaking of? It's speaking of holiness. It's speaking of perfection. It's speaking of a holiness that none of us were born with. Our hands do those things that are wrong. Our hearts are corrupted by sin. Our soul is filled with pride. And our lips will condemn us for the foolish talking that we often engage in and the foolish sinful things we say are recorded before God. Each of these things are sinful and they separate us from God. Each of these things must be punished and judged. And only those who have acknowledged their sin and only those who have called on the Lord to save them from their sin know the cleansing that makes them right before God. The good news of the gospel is that why none of us are worthy to stand before God. None of us are worthy for heaven. None of us are worthy even to, as it were, come into the presence of God. Christ has died for sinners that we might be saved and we might be raised we might be made ready to come before him. That's what 1 Peter 3.15 says, for Christ has also once suffered for sins. The just, that's Christ. For the unjust, that's me. What was the purpose? That he might bring us to God. That's why Christ's suffering as our substitute brings us to God when we receive his work by faith. So what happens? How can we have this perfection? How can we have this cleanliness? And how can we have this holiness in our lives? Well, it says, verse number five, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of our salvation. What does this remind us? That salvation is a gift from God. We receive it. We receive it as we call upon the Lord. Salvation is to have a righteousness from God. In other words, as you stand in your sin today, God sees you as a sinner. But there are Christians in this gathering today. How does God view them? Well, when God looks upon the Christian, he doesn't see the sinful nature that they once had, but rather he sees Christ's nature, his righteousness. The Bible describes it as a robe of righteousness. And therefore, as God the Father looks upon us today as Christians, he sees Christ, the work of Christ. We are viewed through Christ. We are accepted as Christ is accepted. We are loved as Christ is loved. We are part of the family of God as Christ also is. He took our sins and he gives us his righteousness. And that's the only way you can stand before God. When Christ has taken your sin and given you his righteousness, that's the only way you can stand before God. That's to be made like our Savior, to be with him eternally. It is only through the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary, trusting that that blood will cleanse you from sin and that he will give you that robe of righteousness. Have you got that robe this morning? I can look around this congregation and I know you didn't just roll out of bed and pick up the first thing. 
You made an effort to come dressed to the house of God, and we appreciate that reverence. But friend, have you got the garment of salvation? Are you wearing the robe of the righteousness? The preacher can't see it this morning. Nobody else can see it, but God knows and God sees. Have you received from God salvation and the robe of righteousness? And it says in verse 6, This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. And this is a reality for the Christian who has sought the Lord in his or her life. Their eternal generation or life, and that's what the word means, life, eternal life, shall be perfect holiness. You see, someday we will be in heaven. I will have clean hands that will never be dirty again. We'll have a pure heart that will never be corrupted again. We will be like Christ. We will be without sin. And you know what? It's impossible for us to sit here today and imagine what that is like because we have never known a day without the effects of sin in our life. We've never known a day without failure. We've never known a day when we've not regretted something. But oh, what a day it will be when we're made like our Savior. That's the reality of heaven. Is it yours today? Have you sought him? That's what it says. Those that seek thy face. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return on to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him for he will abundantly pardon. God can pardon you this morning. Dear sinner, no matter where you've been, what you've done, how deep and dark and sin you are, I don't know, I don't need to know. The Lord knows this morning and still he says, seek him. Call upon him and he will pardon you. But as I read through verse number four and five, not only is this imagery in regards to salvation and how a person when they die can stand before the Lord, we can only stand before the Lord in Christ, we are complete in him. But we also can consider this passage uh, to speak of intercession or prayer. Because is it not true that when we come to pray, we ascend into the hill of the Lord? We go to higher ground. We go to the throne room of God. We stand in the holy place. We stand before the Lord. And that's what prayer is. It's coming into the presence of God and speaking to him. And friend, we can ask that question, who shall ascend in the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place in prayer? You see, the Lord calls us to seek him and to seek his face. Look at Psalm 27, just over there a couple of uh, verses. In Psalm 27, verse number seven, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. We know that that is in the attitude of prayer. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And if you turn there just for a few moments, and you may know this well, but sometimes we just stop after the well-known verses. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord. That word thoughts in the Hebrew means plans. The plans God has for you. I know there are those who started a new school, uh, maybe university or college or uh, even new job. And the Lord has a plan for you. And maybe you're anxious about it, what the future holds. The Lord has a plan for your life, dear Christian. And you're to rest in him and wait in him and he will fulfill that and show you the way. Look what the plan is. I know the thoughts are the plans. I think toward you, saith the Lord, plans of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. This is part of the plan of God for you to be a seeker of God. To give him every day of your new job, your new school, whatever has come into your life that's new. And look what the promise is. Verse 13. And ye shall seek me and find me. When ye shall search for me with all your heart, with a focused heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity. 
and I will gather from all the nations, from all the places I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again to the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. So we see this thought of seeking the face of the Lord as being a picture of prayer. Now we are called as Christians to live holy lives. And that means there are things that we will do because they help us to grow as Christians and they help us to come mature and help us to become like Christ, their character. But it also means there are things we will not do because we know those things will dishonor the Lord and grieve the Spirit of God. But one of the things we are called to do is to pray. And whenever we come to pray, we must remember that the God to whom we pray, he's holy. Holy, holy, holy. That's the chorus of heaven. That's what the seraphim sing around the throne of God. Holy, holy, holy. And therefore, we must come appropriately into the presence of a thrice holy God. Now, that is not to be fearful in coming, but that is to be reverent in coming. And coming appropriately and speaking to the Lord appropriately. We're bid to come. We're invited to come. We're commanded to come. The throne room is open to us. The scepter is stretched forth. We are to come before the throne. But how should we come? Well, verse number four is a very good checklist for us to consider as we come to pray. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, he hath not lifted up his soul on the vanity nor sworn deceitfully. Now, if we are to communicate with God, then it's essential that there's nothing between us and the Lord. Every Christian has to confess that they sin daily in thought and in word and in deed. Even this day, we've done things that have been displeasing to the Lord, things that really we should not have done. Now, that does not, stand or ch- or that does not change our standing in Christ because we cannot lose our salvation. But sin in the Christian's life does affect our fellowship with God. And we cannot expect to have that freedom of prayer conversation between us and the Lord if there's unconfessed sin in our lives or unrepented of sin in our lives. So what do we do? What do we do if we're coming to the place of prayer and there's something in our life that's wrong? Well, 1 John 1, 9, uh, this is for each believer. This was written to believers, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And therefore, if you're coming to seek God's face in prayer, you come with confession of sin. You ask the Lord to forgive you for those sins you know you committed. Don't try and pull the wool over the eyes of the Lord. But be honest before God. Lord, I said that thing and I shouldn't have said it. I thought that thing and I shouldn't have thought it. Lord, you know what I did today. And I confess it was sinful. It was wrong before thee. And the promise is, he is faithful and just, forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David even prayed, King David, the one who wrote this psalm, he even prayed that the Lord would show him sins in his life that he wasn't aware of, that he might put them right. Search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What I want to do in the closing minutes of this meeting is look at those four things and just make a comment on them in verse number four. And I think we just simply want to give a very practical thought on how to approach God in prayer. So what should we confess daily and make sure is right before God? First of all, we want clean hands. So we have to confess any sins that we have done any sins that we have committed, whether it's theft, whether it's harming another by withholding help or aid, whether it's going to a place we shouldn't have been, watching something we shouldn't have watched, listening to something we shouldn't have listened to, whatever it is, you need to confess that before Lord. I say, Lord, forgive me and cleanse me from this thing. And give me victory over it next time it comes tempting me. Give me victory over it through the blood of Jesus Christ. Forgive me and cleanse me afresh. Then it says, not only do we need clean hands, but we need a pure heart. 
So we need to confess and make sure that any evil or sin within the heart is confessed and repented of. So what does that mean? Well, it's a longing after sinful things. So if you're sitting, maybe even in this church service, thinking of something that's sinful and something that you just can't wait to get home and be at or whatever, but you need to confess that before God. Impure thoughts, maybe unkind thoughts toward others. Oh, you would never say it, of course not, but you would think it. That needs to be confessed. Now, no preacher or member of a congregation can see your mind or your thoughts, but God can. He can see it clearly. And friend, you cannot come before the Lord harboring evil thoughts against someone else. You'd be as well to pray to the ceiling because that's as far as it's going. You know what the Bible said about the Pharisee? He prayed thus with himself. There was a prayer meeting going on and God was hearing and blessing another man in that room. But he prayed with, the, with himself. So we need to get the heart emptied and cleansed. Then it says we also need those who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity. So that's pride within the soul. And pride is an awful thing. Because once you've almost got it knocked in the head, you're proud you've done it. You're back to start again. There seems to be no let up from pride. Others should be like me. If they were only living the way I was living and doing what I did and, you know, following my way, <laughs> they'd be better. The church would be better. But is that the way you're living? Is that the thought within your heart? You need to get that confessed before God. He's not what he should be. And she's not what they should be. And you become judge, jury, and executioner over someone whom you don't really know, over uh, actions that you don't know why they're being committed. You don't know what the person is going through. Maybe the difficulties going on in their life and you're judging left, right, and center. Friend, that's pray. Get it out of your heart right now. Whenever we say he's not what he should be or she's not what she should be, the implication is that we're okay, we're right. And friend, that's wrong. But then there's another type of pride which comes into the Christian's life. I don't need to be kind. I don't need to love. I don't need to be in submission to my brethren. I don't need to be faithful to my church. Oh, you wouldn't say it, but your actions show it. And friend, if that's your attitude, I don't need to show love to my fellow believers. And I don't need to be kind. Before you start praying, you need to confess before God the pride of your heart. And then any wrong words that have been spoken, for it says, nor sworn deceitfully. False accusation, accusing people falsely, slander, gossip, lies, withholding truth, not telling the whole truth, giving a distorted view of something. Friend, that is to swear, to swear deceitfully. Cursing and condemning others, a misuse and abusive prayer. A misuse and abusive prayer. You see, sometimes in the prayer meeting, and we're going to prayer meetings now, so this is very, the Lord has worked it all out, so we're in the right passage and the right day and everything's falling into place. Sometimes in prayer meetings, people get up to pray, and you know what they do? They preach a sermon. We're going to a prayer meeting. We're to pray on to the Lord. Some people get up in a prayer meeting and they attack other Christians. Oh, they don't say it, but everybody knows what they're talking about. And then sometimes in the prayer meeting, people want to try and make a point. What they think of the church what their political affiliation is. And all they're doing is making a point. 
They're not seeking the Lord. They're not genuinely humbled before the Lord. I was thinking of the words of a hymn, and, and I, I tell you, it challenged my heart as I thought about it. That hymn, it says, uh, Love divine, all love's excelling. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless may we be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly, restored in thee. Listen to these words, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. That's what's missing in prayer. The wonder of who our God is. True love, sacrificial love that we heard about last week of giving our best, giving our all and praise for what God has done. Oh, I know there's much we would love to see done and I know there's many things that grieve us, but where's the praise in our prayer? God has saved you and kept you. God has maybe saved your family. God has answered prayer after prayer. Where's the praise? And the prayer meeting is not a place for the list of your complaints. It's a place of wonder, love, and praise as you come before God. And therefore, don't abuse it. But pray the Lord would empty of self and sin and give you a vision of Christ where your heart will overflow in praise and worship adoration I'll tell you it will change our lives may God give us grace to do that why should I make the effort preacher why should I confess these things why should I open this verse and underline it and make it a life verse why should I bother because in Psalm 84 verse 11 it says the Lord is the sun and shield the Lord will give grace and glory and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Trying to pray for the blessing of God while holding on to your sin is to ask God to withhold the good thing from you. Oh, may God give us hearts that are emptied of self and sin as we stand in his presence today. We're going to sing our closing hymn and then we'll pray. 612, there is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. May we have a taste of heaven upon earth today and may we know the real blessing of the Lord's presence among us. Let's stand and sing this and remain standing for prayer.
Heavenly Father, we thank thee there is coming a day when we will be changed and made like our Savior. Thank you, Lord, there's coming a day when we will know what it is to love thee with unsinning heart. And we pray, O Lord, that you will change us from glory into glory. Lord, make us more like our Savior. And we pray, Lord, that you'll, Lord, take that hardness and pride out of our hearts. And Lord, help us to stand before thee this evening with clean hands, with a pure heart. Oh, Lord, with a mind that's been given over.